We have an incredible deal for you today. You can get a graphics card that is 20% faster than a 3080, according to some tests, but according to NVIDIA, three times faster than a 3090. We've got to deal with what happens when, uh, well, when one company gets 90% market share. Turns out they can go a little bit crazy with things. And we've really got to deal with NVIDIA today because following the rebranding of the very ill-fated 12 gigabyte 4080, we now have the 4070 Ti, which is of course basically the same thing. And uh, yeah, it's not going well at all. The internet is on fire. There's also a, quite an interesting schism between what the press have reviewed things as, taking a pretty, uh, I guess, a pretty milk toast look of, oh, here's how the card's doing. Is it, you know, is it is it better than the other cards for the extra price? And the answer is resoundingly sure. But then you look at the more, let's say, the more consumer-oriented people over on YouTube are going, what does this mean for the future? What is this like for gamers? What does this mean for, for us right now and also for PC gaming? And the answer is NVIDIA are doing the absolute Lord's work for Sony and Microsoft, and even Nintendo at this point in time, because they're going out of their way to make sure PC gaming is dying a very slow death. Now, yeah. it's not. It's still growing. But if this continues for a couple generations... <sighs> and there's more, because once you know a lot of people have shifted over to their newer architectures, NVIDIA will begin to have a pretty severely moated audience because That's they have like, yeah. platform-specific features, including some new, like, AI-accelerated uh, graphics drivers that if AMD cannot compete with, then we could be in a really severe, kind of getting a bit monopolistic-like uh, situation. Yeah, I'm, so sure, I'm sure people remember the, uh, was the hair tessellation in Tomb Raider? Oh, yes. That, th those games were all AMD heavy, and I was like, they still run better in video cards. So hopefully it doesn't work out so well for NVIDIA, even though I like a lot of the features in the cards. It is still just, oh, we're starting to get into where is the where is the regulation in this industry coming in and gonna go right, can we cam it here, please? Yeah, you you absolutely cannot knock the engineers. Yeah, not uh, at all. never be at hardware or software at NVIDIA because they do incredible work. Now, of course, if we look at the 4080, 12 gig, and the 4070 Ti, they do in fact uh, appear to be exactly the same. Now, they do have a, a price drop. It is a one hundred dollar. Theoretically. Theoretically price drop. Mm -hmm. You see. We say theoretically because with those other cards, NVIDIA had Founders Editions, right? The ones that they sold themselves, and they sold those at MSRP. So while this card does have an MSRP of $799, there are no Founders Editions, meaning it is only the, uh, like, you know, their third party uh, manufacturers who are, who are going to be offering cards here. Mm -hmm. So that is something that will be uh, interesting in the market. And if we compare the price differentials between the 70 Ti's and the 80's in past uh, generations, we see that the 3070 Ti was basically half the price of a 3080, whereas the 4070 Ti is 66.64% the price of a 4080 at RRP. That is the RRP of the 4080, which you could get because NVIDIA was selling uh, Founders Editions, versus the RRP, which you maybe won't be able to get of the 4070 because there are no, uh, you know, no Founders. Yeah. And don't forget that they almost got away with it being $100 more. Yes. The only reason it wasn't a 4080 $100 more is because everyone went, listen to NVIDIA, we see what you're doing, we know what you're doing. That's the 4070 Ti. Don't bullshit us. And they still go, ah, oh, it's hundred dollar off. Everyone, everyone, fine. They they corrected just as little as they needed to, to to roughly get away with it, though they still take a hammering as we will yeah. into. Yeah, and to be able to sort of match uh, what AMD yeah. are are casting out into the market. Now, of course, you've also got to remember that you know these aren't founders editions; these are partner cards. How did this actually work in the back end? Well, their add in board partners went and made all these cards. Right, they manufactured these forty uh, eighties. Then they had to rebadge them. So number one, I've got to wonder what it's like with their margins. Uh, we did hear that Nvidia would uh, compensate them, of course, mm. for the like the cost of uh, at least like you know the rebadging and the kind of remaking their packaging and stuff. I would still say like Nvidia would have to reimburse them such that it's a profit to the company because the opportunity cost of rebadging all those cards will suck for those add-in board partners. With all this sort of thing going on, is it any wonder that say EVGA? 
decided, you know what, we're just not going to do business with NVIDIA anymore. They just suck to work with. We then hear, I think it was on the WAN show, uh, Linus heavily insinuating that, like, yeah, Asus may be a larger company, but NVIDIA will still treat them like shit, too. So it's all pretty crazy. And when we look at how much these prices are, you know, these cards are going for, over on Newegg, we do actually see here's a 799, but of course, a lot of them are, you know, they are going to be more expensive, mm -hmm. right? Um, which, you know, it's funny. Maybe for the Adam Board partners, this is a nice reprieve from having to uh, basically compete with NVIDIA uh, in the market with the Founders Editions, which yeah. uh, itself is, I guess, an interesting dynamic to, uh, to the business model. So ultimately then, yeah, it does just feel like with the uh, original plan of the 4080, they were just obviously trying to uh, optimize their revenue as much as they could. Of course, the why to that is really, really clear. I mean, could you imagine being an absolute, like, could you imagine massively inflated resale value on your cards? Uh, <laughs> retailers pricing based on market demand, so vastly above MSRP, and you are... What do you do? You sell founders cards like a daughter clots at MSRP. So I think what happened in the, the myriad of times were because of crypto or chip shortages or whatever, where uh, card prices have like spiked up super high. Uh, people in the market have very obviously shown a willingness to uh, to buy cards at a vastly uh, in, inflated. Yeah, yeah. Just a vastly inflated uh, price. And I think we're going to see that you can have the broad, like the number of sales contract, but if NVIDIA are able to sell at a super, super high margin, they don't need to sell as many cards. And we'll get into that with some numbers. But first, oh, yeah. I think we should talk about the reviews. Yeah, because I mean, we have to actually talk about the card itself to see if it's worth anything. And I think there's a couple of little mixed things, but I think the resounding, the resounding uh, overall feedback across everyone is it's not necessarily a bad card. It's a good card with a nice, small generational update. Yep. And it's in the same way that <laughs> NVIDIA traditionally like have a massive uh, generational boost like they did with the 3000 series. And then they have a smaller boost of, oh, hey, we've optimized that architecture a little bit. Okay, we'll see what we can do for the next one. So it's like in terms of if you're an, a hyper enthusiast and you want your like 240 frames per second for your games, yeah, sure. But as far as a you're going to build a new PC is this worth the money? The answer is like, oh, they are not making a market good for themselves here. They've, yeah. not made, they've not made this product compete with their own older products at all. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like if you buy this versus like, you know, the, the equivalent of the past series or even something in the past series that costs roughly the same amount of money, that like this would be like the better card. It would inch above it and then get mm. some of the... Uh, is it Ada? Ada? Anyway, some yeah, of the, the Lovelace, yeah. yeah, some of the the Lovelace architecture uh, benefits, but it isn't that like ginormous jump. It's kind of interesting that the forty, like the forty ninety, is the card that's really rather surprisingly uh, before this anyway. On the whole, performance to cost curve, the forty ninety was actually better than the forty eighty. It really seemed. I think and that was actually technically misproven on in terms of pure uh, price to FPS ratio. But it's more the fact that if you think about it from a holistic point of view, the perspective is that there's if you're going for if you're a four K gamer, or you're like you want your four K reaches or you want to hit decent frame rates, this isn't good enough to hit that bench benchmark. The forty seven Ti, it's. Like the 4090 is just a better option if you want to buy something and keep it, it and yes. have a good experience at the same time. This is like just not good enough to be worth it yet. I feel like the, if you imagine, right, the diminishing returns curve, and if it would kind of spike up like this, the diminishing curve, uh, the diminishing returns curve this time, it's been a bit flatter. Like the, the 4090 has not been as bad a deal compared to like the 4080 as you would have expected. Uh, based on the previous gens. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just interesting. Like the 4090s there is this Halo product, I suppose, that kind of shows like, holy shit, they can make an utterly incredible GPU. Yeah, it's- um, But we're not exactly having that good vibe come to uh, to the rest of the series. Yeah, it's like, I think the, the way to describe it is they've made the 4090 a good investment for PC gamers and people who are yeah. very much future-proofing. But the 4070 Ti, previously known as the 4080 12 gig, was not that good an investment. And that's where we're starting to run into problems from like the, 
I guess, because you can talk about it, obviously you could say, well, if they sell fewer cards at higher prices, they don't need to sell as many cards. But whenever the entire market's doing that, that leaves a lot of people stuck going, well, what's, where's the card for me? And if the entire market's decided, well, the only people who are going to buy cards and give NVIDIA money are going to be the, like, the early adopters and the really, like, the hyper-tech enthusiasts, then everyone else gets hand-me-downs. If they're lucky enough to get the hand-me-downs on, like, sale somewhere else, uh, it results in this, like, generally kind of scuffed market overall because they're not focusing on making good cards for the smaller markets. It's like, just get as much money as we can, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, hey, do you want to run Valorant at 4K, 480 frames per second on your new 480 FPS monitor. Um, now, where it is, it is quite interesting, though, is the competition with AMD. Yes. So on the 7900 XT, it does appear that you uh, you could be getting slightly better rasterization performance, but you don't get those platform features like the DLSS3. Uh, you got worse power efficiency, worse ray tracing performance, which is, I think, not particularly <laughs> meaningful to nope. a lot of people. Um, but when we go on to the YouTube side, that's where it gets interesting. So in NVIDIA's marketing, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of uh, the people on YouTube are just flat out saying NVIDIA lied. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the NVIDIA are claiming a 3x improvement over the 3090 Ti. Um, per what Steve and the crew over at um, Gamers Nexus are finding, it's more like a 1.3x performance uh, improvement. And that's where it kind of gets interesting to me because... It so heavily depends, in, in some cases, on the game, right? And I guess NVIDIA can put a lot of their eggs into the ray tracing basket and yeah. tout this incredible ray tracing performance improvement. Because, like, think about the, say, the, even the 2080 or 2080 Ti. Like, those were big, expensive cards. It was the first generation of RTX. And to be honest, it really didn't make that much sense to turn it on in many cases because the performance just wasn't good enough. So, yeah, we would kind of need these massive improvements in ray tracing performance. But I think at the end of the day, it's raster that most gamers care about. Because, like, oh, yeah. if, if you're a company, if you, you know, if you're a big games company, like, you know, whatever you're doing in the ray tracing realm, it pretty much has to be clipped to what a PS5 and Series X can do. And, yeah, being able to, you know, turn it up a, a bit more, yeah, that's helpful. But it's not like, say, not that this is a perfect example, but you know, you look at like the new Ratchet and Clank game on the PS5 that was only made possible by its storage architecture. Like, we're not really at the stage of ray tracing adoption where it's like, oh yeah, we can make this transformationally different, uh, I don't know, whatever sort of game mm -hmm. that like massively uses ray tracing. Because like, how many people are going to be able to actually like play that on PC. Yeah, don't worry. We have stats from Steam. We'll get into that later on mm -hmm. to illustrate just how scuffed the point is. But I think a lot of the issues people had here was uh, for the like the YouTube side and what you'll see obviously here like the thumbnails are just, you know, Jay's so sick of this crap. Linus says NVIDIA's lying to you. Steve's calling it a ripoff. It's saying WTF. And that's because they were... I guess the best way to describe it is they engaged in what people consider just unfaithful marketing. Where obviously, like the the three X improvement being actually thirty percent, Steve says that there's a decent chance that is actually just a typo or just a mistake, and that's like if that if that's true, that's bad. But it like it's they're not you know you you can that forgive is. a mistake, but otherwise they're using all of their DLSS three numbers and as many numbers as they can to cherry pick benches. Yeah. To go, this is so much better here, 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 and here. And they are technically highlighting, they are saying, okay, well, this is literally true. This is literally because of this. And you go, okay, well, you're you're not lying there, but it's that uh, when you read the detail, you know they're not lying. You can get, you understand the whole picture, you get the context. But if you look at this at a glance, because you're just an average consumer who's not paying attention to like the details, you'll have that anchored idea of, oh, this is so much better. This is such a better card. Look at the massive performance gains from DLSS3, from all these things. And some of those might be like real, but it is kind of, it's that point where they're a little bit misleading and it's in the vein of marketing being slightly misleading as opposed to being anything particularly, uh, particularly gruesome, but it just leaves a bad taste in people's mouths overall. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it furthers their moat. This is, yeah. this is the real thing that I think needs to be talked about uh, more, right? So... In a lot of cases, monopoly is the outcome. The company that can edge ahead 
is generally going to be able to edge ahead more and more and more as they're able to reinvest more and more and more in what they're doing. Continue. NVIDIA obviously has done that. Um, so DLSS frame generation, like you don't have that on the other side. Now, what happens when, as adoption increases, more and more people are used to using the performance benefits of frame generation or even just regular DLSS as that gets better and better and better and better? Suddenly, then AMD are at a point where, like, let's just say, right for the sake of argument, uh, and I suppose it's generally been thought that, like, the downside with AMD is maybe your drivers aren't as, you know, aren't yeah. as, like, prompt or, or, you know, perfect or whatever. Um, you then end up in a situation where as AMD, yeah, like your raw raster performance is now not even the thing that you're competing against. You almost need to open up a new division or put a lot more resources into some division to uh, get a hell of a lot more yeah. on the R&D front. And I also sort of get the feeling that um, like in enterprise, I get the feeling that NVIDIA are maybe a bit more entrenched in like the enterprise GPU sector. I think so. Maybe. Yeah, like I, I'm fairly sure they are anyway, mm. but it's just like all of these compounding uh, benefits that are going to put this moat around uh, around their slice of the market because it's no longer just, hey, look at our graphics card, plug it in, raster performance. Now it's a bunch of other things that people are going to become more and more and more used to. Even take the LSS. Like, it, it is... Uh, I know there, like, there are other versions of that. There's yeah, an Intel right. one. Yeah. There's the AMD one. I think in many cases, NVIDIA still does edge out ahead. I think, if I'm fairly sure DLS, DLSS 3 is the one with frame generation that everyone's going, oh, yeah, you, it's you, the frame you can just double your frame rate and it's intelligent enough to not just be it randomly generating a frame in the middle. It's actually like good and it, it is a full, if you want just frames, it is such a good experience comparatively. You're like, oh shit. It basically depends if like the input latency would be yeah. something you'd like notice or would put you off. Um, which like there is input latency. It's not as bad as I think some of us feared, yeah. which is very impressive for the engineers, but it, like still does exist. But who knows? Maybe they'll be able to get that to somehow be faster, right? So just all of these things are kind of worrying. Uh, yeah, they're, they're just worrying to me. Um, I mean, if you take a look at the CPU space, I, I feel like... You know, that there hasn't been an equivalent of DLSS for your CPU. Mm -hmm. And of course, we then saw AMD be able to disrupt uh, Intel super successfully to the point now where Intel is, I think, also it, the competition's made Intel better, basically. Yep. Sure um, of course, Intel tried to enter the GPU space with Arc, and it's like <laughs> nice effort, but man, you're starting so behind. So, there is a little bit more here on the laptop front. There are the 40 series uh, laptops, up to 170 of them from various different manufacturers. They are saying 4K 60 at the highest end. So yeah, you can get a 4090 laptop. Obviously, it's not a full fat 4090. Look at the size of a 4090, look at the size of a laptop. But yeah, that's all coming. and. In fairness, I think a lot of those platform benefits, they make so much more sense on a laptop. Uh, yeah, the reason I say that is like, if you have a 4090, you probably don't need frame generation for modern games, but a cut down, like, I don't know, 4060 laptop, it still is able to give you that frame gen. For, for like a, a lot of, for a lot of games, that's really going to come in clutch. So they're, I think, looking pretty damn uh, strong. They've also been rolling out 4080 clusters to GeForce Now. Um, that's mm. available at the highest tier of um, of that. And it's funny with GeForce Now. Honestly, I really want to take, um, I, want to, I want to take a second look into it. Mm. I do remember a few times where I was playing Guild Wars 2 uh, and we had two laptops, right? Uh, this mac and uh crossfire was being a bit annoying uh and uh, a razor blade so there's guild wars 2 running in the blade and then guild wars 2 running on geforce now and it was like in that moment we had a problem of two people trying to play the same mm -hmm. game that's not supported in one system and bam sort of it's actually a pretty damn good experience so i want to loop back into that but uh overall then oh yeah also they're adding their reflex 240 hertz modes uh, for competitive games the idea of someone playing a competitive game streamed is insane to me uh, because, yeah, sure, it's 240 hertz, 
but frame rate is very different to latency, and I certainly have questions there. Yeah, you, but, would, you would get you would get frames faster in between, theoretically, and you wouldn't have to wait as long for the first frame if it's rendered faster. But you'd still have literal latency to worry about. Yeah, but hey, if you could flip that mode on for like non esports titles, mm. then maybe it could get a you know a better experience. Yeah. But when we look at the wider market, is any surprise that amidst this desktop GPU sales have hit a twenty year low, and that was. Honestly, that was a that was shocking to me. It's a wake up call. These like? these are like the lowest figures since two thousand and five. I mean, shit. When was the uh, eight eighty, uh, the eight thousand eight hundred GT or is it GTX? Oh, that man. legendary card that like just a all GT of, back then, right? Huh? It was just a GT back then, I think. Yeah, because that was okay. the legendary card at the time. Um, I don't. I actually don't know what that is in relation to two thousand and five. It's probably a few years after. Mm. Um, but that's insane. Like, straight up, that's mad. And in spite of all of this, though, NVIDIA's market share is 86%. AMD's has fallen to 10%. That's not good. That's why we should be worried. I, I mean, we all remember whenever AMD, like, what, you were using the, oh, was it the 6300 Black Edition? <laughs> uh, I forget that card, but like that, that it, it may as well have been the only AMD card to exist. And I think there was some hyper budget options, but like beyond that, it was just Intel. You don't have a choice. You have to use Intel. Um, and obviously Ryzen is what saved AMD in that situation. And if you just have to look at those numbers, like even though there are good things to say about the new AMD cards, those numbers speak volumes. And that is very annoying. <laughs> And also, NVIDIA, by their own admission, were undershipping last year. Yeah, that's like it's when it comes into them using specific sales tactics to try and get rid of stock and, and I guess not play their A game in order to maximize their use of the market because they have full control and they can play around instead of having like AMD on their tail is where you get into these really interesting situations where people just feel like they can't go and buy a graphics card, especially not a new one, especially not one that's like good and will last forever unless they have the. 20 million dollars to get a 4080 obviously that's an exaggeration but you know it feels very much that way everyone's going i can't buy a graphics card i would like one i don't really feel like i need one eh. and that leaves us in a really dire spot overall yeah yeah and that's led to this current lineup that you know for those who can't afford it they can get a fantastic end experience but it <laughs> just feels bad for, uh, for for everyone else, and uh, I mean, well, actually, I guess on the AMD side, we do have to talk about the heating issue. Basically, it does seem that there's a manufacturing flaw with the vapor chamber, uh, the vapor chamber, um, mm -hmm. that has been causing overheating issues. It's one of those things. Some people have the problem, some people don't, but it is a fairly major issue. It's been leading to some cards hitting 110 degrees which is not what they should be hitting. That is not like no, no. not good for the card's longevity. So yeah, basically it seems to just be a certain batch of RX 7900 XTXs. Yeah. Bit of a silly product name. Yeah. And you wonder, well, what's the what's the end result to you? What's the end result of, to people of this happening? And it does, uh, I know Lion has been into it in depth in their uh, review, and I think um, Jay's two cents talked about it as well, where it's like, with the combination of the cost of living, the combination of consoles being really good bang for their buck these days, and then the combination of like Nvidia just going, we'll just we'll just scalp ourselves. Why let scalpers do the work when we can do it ourselves? We can just make cards that are decently better, not bad cards by stretch of the imagination, but they're not revolutionary. AMD can't catch up just yet. We're building this mode around us. We have this incredible market share. We'll just do the scalping ourselves. And then what's the result? The result is Steam hardware survey. Yeah, and so you see what happens with Hoppa, <clears throat> who owns what graphics cards and why. Biggest the card out there, GTX 1650. Mm -hmm. Yep. 6%. Then you go down to a 1060, a 2060, a 1050 Ti, 3060 laptop, 3060, 3070, 1660 Super. Uh, like, how long do you have to go before you get an 80? The answer is all the way down here. Yeah. Right? That's where you hit the RTX 3080. 
Um, which is kind of funny because it's actually almost neck and neck with uh, AMD Radeon <laughs> graphics, which I'm assuming that's the like, um, oh, that's the APU situation in the more budget end. That's like actually pretty sweet for what it is. Mm -hmm. Certainly better than Intel Iris, which is down there at 1.5. But I mean, the point here is, is pretty damn simple, right? The, the, like, yeah. I don't have to explain this. Yeah. this table to yeah. you you can see the vast majority of the cards that people are using to play video games are the lower budget ones and that's not where nvidia are putting their effort in and that's like okay well then what purpose are you serving are you serving this the, the actual market at all or are you <clears throat> just serving one small subset that you can scalp for more money and you can get like just i guess in the same sense of like gacha games trying to wheel is nvidia just wheeling is that all they're doing is it just wheeling for the most for the people who are so embedded that they will buy at buy that at whatever yeah. cost. In the same way that so many game devs or uh, let's say, should say publishers are like selling hundreds of dollars editions and going, ah, it's fine. We'll make we'll make all the money off providing less value to people who will outspend what they probably should reasonably be doing. And that's just it. Just keeps going that way and that way. And I, until, I feel like if, if people are wondering, you know, wh why not go for volume? Why not make more money by uh, selling, you know, so many more cards? Well, I would say, like, man, you should take a look at the, like, sales figures and, uh, like, market caps <laughs> of luxury brands. Yeah. Like, um, oh, that is that silly Spanish one that, you know, they had the weird Crocs that cost a stupid amount of money. Oh, I can't remember. Um, but you look at, like, those fashion brands and it's insane, you know? You've got your, like, Louis Vuitton who's selling you this, like okay quality bag for the most insane markup now i'm sure uh, nvidia are not dealing with any you know similar markups there well, but they're, I, they're, I, <laughs> I say this just to make the point um you can make a shitload of money by selling things to people who have money instead of playing the commodities game because like the more and more and more you optimize your revenue around high volume low margin like that reduces the agility of your company etc 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 right so you can like totally see why uh, why Nvidia would like to do that, yeah. and they're the way that they're rolling this stuff out. I mean, obviously, kind of slowly over time, so that they're maximally optimizing the the revenue for the people who are like, oh, I want to buy the card now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, hey, look, it it is what it is, and that is a problem for us. Yeah, because none of us are strong enough to uh, to really change this in the market. There's only one bit of there's only one viable competition. And that's AMD. Mm -hmm. And are AMD going to be able to get frame generation uh, as good as NVIDIA? You could also say Intel are uh, are there with ARC. But, you know, if, if we're going to be talking about Intel ARC as competition, <laughs> I'd say, like, <laughs> Xbox uh, cloud gaming is probably more competition than Intel ARC is at this stage. Um, so I suppose this is going to push people towards streaming services, which NVIDIA is pretty heavily embedded in, and uh, and consoles. Well, that's why I was literally, I was just looking at the price of 1650. Uh, this is UK price, of course, but if you want a 1650, you're probably spending about 180, 200 quid in the UK. So it's probably around the same in the US. And you think, oh, well, hmm, hmm. that seems pretty budget. You could fit that into like a decent, maybe 600, 800 dollar build for 1080p gaming. And they go... Obviously, this isn't going into like the extra cost of being on a platform for console because you can't get yeah. access to super cheap games the way you can on like PC and stuff, or the, or the free to plays. Well, you can get plenty, but it's like it seems like by not offering a middle ground themselves and leaving the middle ground open to like the pre-owned market, which might be might be an okay shot for them overall, but it feels like no one's paying attention to the middle of the road customer. There's the budget customer who can get the old cards, they're fine, and they are doing that, and then they can get 1080p gaming for the same for slightly more than they could just go buy a console and get access to 4k gaming obviously lots of asterisks on the experience but if you're talking about the average customer it's like what do you want do you want to get an old 1080p monitor and play games or do you want to hook it up to your 4k tv and get a better experience and it feels like for a lot of people who are kind of not to say casual gamer like a do mean kind of oh they only play whatever whatever games but for people who are like who aren't gamers and that's not how they identify that's just it's a it's a hobby of theirs not a massive part of their life there's a decent chance some like oh yeah someone's going to explain to them here this is how to get into pc gaming and they go well what how, what price i'm looking at 
Well, you could either get something worse than what a console offers you for about six hundred dollars for the same price of a console, or you could spend two thousand dollars and get something really good. And they go, no, not at all. No, thank you. And it's that point of there's there's missing that option to go a couple hundred dollars above and get an on par experience. And it feels like that's what they're not really well, putting in. And yeah. that's I I feel and a lot of people online feel like that is the beginning of an existential crisis for PC gaming so, as a whole. On that, like, to, to be real about the macroeconomic situation that mm. we're in. So yeah. you've got people who, you know, they were uh, pretty well off a few years ago. They're still going to be well off, right? Because we've maybe have increased costs of uh, goods that have been beyond, uh, you know, the increases in wages. Well, the thing is, if you're earning a lot of money as a percentage of your overall income, the recent cost of living increases are not going to be noticeable to you. I mean, sure, you might notice your, you go out for a meal and it's a bit more expensive, but to those people, it won't really matter. Uh, mm. Versus, I think, the majority of people for whom, uh, you know, the, the costs, uh, the cost increases for electricity, for food, etc., are genuinely eating a sizable, very noticeable chunk out of their disposable income. And that's maybe for the lucky ones, because for a lot of people, th this is pushing them under the line and they're having to dip into their emergency funds. Yep. You know, we even have a situation where, and it was the most, like, I almost thought it was a bit macabre and weird, uh, you know, the, the king's speech oh, yeah. in, the, in the UK for, you know, there's always like a Christmas address thingy. Um, talking about food banks. That was rough. And yeah. it's like, food banks, like, yeah, it's good that people are volunteering. Great. You know, up the volunteers. Awesome. Also, what the hell? This is not a sign of a good yeah. thing. Yeah, it's the, And in, in that market, are you going to try to make more 1650s? Mm. No. You're going to sell to the people who were buying 3090s a few years ago because their overall financial position is not as heavily impacted. Mm. And that's that's like the harsh economic reality that I think is, you know, I think NVIDIA have probably clued onto this. And I think that's probably the strategy that they're content to roll with. Mm. Um, and then it's quite hard because it's like for them, it's a business. And I'm sure many people who work in that business are passionate gamers who love the hobby. Absolutely. But for so many other people, it's like, well, all right, I guess I just can't play new games now. And when they are able to afford it, the only way they're going to be able to play new games, it, it's probably going to be a console. Yep. And that's going to have... Uh, okay, well, maybe not because consoles are so much of the AAA pie overall. But even if you think about Sony's move to PlayStation... Or Sony's move to PlayStation? Hello. Sony's move to put PlayStation games on PC. Then what if they turn around again? Obviously, they've got scalability going on. But what happens if they throw like Forbidden West up and say this is the big massive game? And it's like, oh, it didn't sell quite as much as we had expected. Oh, is PC market and like maybe not uh, quite as growing as fast as possible? Does that ultimately have an impact on PC gaming in the long term? And that's a thing where it's like a lot of these systemic issues are. Obviously, PC market isn't regulated, right? It's not you know no one no one's sitting and going okay we need to force Nvidia to start getting better experiences for cheaper people to keep PC PC gaming healthy in the future. But it feels like someone should be thinking about that and going, how can we ensure the PC market grows? Because I see so much sentiment online of people going, well, I can't build a PC. And I know that myself. I literally know in terms of like how the financial situation has gone here, I would be very hard pressed to build a PC if something went wrong with, I was, my, I was trying with to... my motherboard and CPU because I'm on a, it was, I can't remember, it was one of the Z series motherboards. It was like one of the, the better ones once the thirty yeah. once the thirty seven hundred X launched, and that is now almost four. That's approaching four years ago. And I got a thirty seven Ryzen seven thirty seven hundred X, and I'm like, okay, well, I couldn't get a new GPU and a new CPU. I'm lucky that that still actually functions pretty nicely, which I'm sure that's that's fine for all these sixty fifties, and all these ten sixties and these twenty sixties. But what happens in two or three years? Yeah. Like I was, um, just before Christmas, I was tasked with putting together, um, well, okay. It was essentially, it had to be a pre-built because yeah. it was non-technical people. Um, I feel like the, the warranty would have been relatively important to them, whatever. So, you know, during Black Friday sales, trying to find a pre-built and I'm like, yeah, I know it's cheaper to build your own. In this case, it wasn't for, you know, it wasn't for us. Yeah. Um, it was 
Because like I always take the view that value is the most important thing. And I think as a lot of us know, often the cheapest thing is not the best value. Now, the most Definitely. expensive thing ain't the best value either. No. The mid-range likely isn't the best value, but there is something at the upper end of what is cheapest that's usually the like a really good point of value. And it was really hard to find a seven to eight hundred pound budget thing that like I felt comfortable with recommending. Transpired the 1080p was the thing to do, so it ended up being fine in the end. But man. It's yeah, it's it's rough. Yeah, that, that's that was very close to a new PC gamer, not born, not there to yeah. get things going. We're that lucky was, that they needed a PC, yeah, like for PC things yeah. as well, or else <laughs> sticking with yeah. uh, you know, because that I think that individual didn't have a new console, mm. and like if the PC wasn't needed, and it's somebody who's you know used to using a gamepad, like you would not be ridiculous to say. Buy a Christmas bundle for a PS5 or a Series X. It's better yep. value. Yeah, a, a lot better value. Yeah, the generation there will be there for a long time, and obviously, you know, you could you could spend like a couple of days writing down a definitive list of pros that PC gaming has over uh, console gaming in the long term, but none of that actually matters if someone literally can't, because the market doesn't support it. Yeah, so I, I guess cookies crumbling like as we leave you today. Um, I think what's important is putting the human side in all of these stories mm -hmm. because we can talk about the NVIDIA bad. Uh, that's great. We should do that. But also, I want to hear, well, how this has impacted you uh, yeah. personally. Um, so I guess just share your stories down below. Um, you know, we, we will take a look and, uh, you know, browse down below as well because you'll be able to see what other people's perspectives are and how like the craziness that's been the GPU market over the last few years has actually disrupted people's hobbies a lot. So mm -hmm. with that, we will leave you certainly a, at the very least, an interesting story to talk about, but man, it's Finger pretty rough. Half, yeah. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.